Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to this meetup on behavioral science and misinformation. Uh, my name is Chiara Varazzani, I'm lead behavioral scientist at the OECD. It is a real pleasure for me to, to moderate, moderate this event today that we co-organize co with our friends at UNDP. So you might have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one being maybe what is a meetup and what do people do at a meetup? And so in practice, with our time today, we'd have two objectives. First of all, we would like to hear from two great speakers who will share their thinking about misinformation. And second, we will discuss about how other people who join us today um, are using behavioral science or would like to use behavioral science to tackle misinformation. And so why we, we decided to, to focus on this topic today? Um, because it seems that the spread of misinformation is becoming more and more serious every day. It is now a potential threat to the future of democracy. We live in a world in which the information ecosystem suffers from limited regulation on one hand, and also increasing algorithmic, algorithmic determinism. A world in which really uh, the media business ecosystem constantly competes for our limited attention. So at the OECD, uh, many are working on misinformation and disinformation, and my colleagues, Carlotta Alfonsi and Craig Matasek, and others in the team are leading um, a stream of work on these with several publications that are open source and av available on the OECD website. Um, right now, right now, the work is focused on developing a set of good, good practice principles on public communications um, to countering mis and disinformation. As for behavioral science, though, we notice that even if the academic literature is quite prolific on misinformation and, and behavioral science, governments are still mainly focusing on traditional tools such as education or regulation with only limited consideration um, to solutions that are based on evidence from behavioral science, such as, for example, proactively changing attitudes and behaviors contributed to the spread of misinformation. So uh, today we are honored to have two speakers from two different continents, uh, Lauren and Breuer, who will give two short presentations on misinformation that will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, to all the people who join us today, uh, we will encourage you to get involved as much as possible um, and ask questions from the very start. So you can see in the Zoom chat, uh, we, there's a link um, where you can submit questions and vote for your favorite questions. And we'll have time to answer those um, during, through our, throughout our meetup. But before we deep dive into our topic, we have a very quick poll question for you. Um, so if you could uh, share the poll question, Sam or Jeanne, that would be great. Um, and our question for you is, there you go. You should be able to see it on your screen. Um, our question for you is, are you currently working on behavioral science and misinformation? Um, so I've seen many of you already answering this question um, because we're really curious to, to see why you're here today, really. And I suggest that while we wait for you to answer the, the poll, I would like to introduce the first speaker, um, Dr. Lauren Conway. So Dr. Conway is Senior Lead for Behavioral Science at the Impact and Innovation Unit within the Private Council in the Canadian federal government. Lauren leads a team of people working on applying behavioral science to many different policy areas, including COVID-19 uh, during the last year. So welcome, Lauren. Uh, before I give you the floor, I will just uh, have a look at what um, people answer at our pool. So we'll share the results. So it seems that it's not a large majority. <laughs> it seems that 50% of the people um, here, they said that they don't currently work on misinformation, but are curious about what behavioral science can, can bring to the, to the topic. So I guess this can also set the tone for, um, for the, 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 the next part of the meetup. So uh, without further ado, Lauren, we're really uh, looking forward to your presentation. And to all people who join, join us, please, again, don't ask answering, um, asking questions. And Lauren, the floor is all yours. 
Thank you so much, Kiara. Um, I'm just going to sort of check in and see if folks can see my screen. Excellent, a thumbs up. Tech is working at uh, this early hour in Canada. I think hopefully some of my team have sort of been able to join. I know for others it might be 4 a.m., so we might not be here in critical mass, but I'm, uh, I'm super excited to see all of the interest in this meetup and selfishly sort of very interested in the conversation to follow. We in Canada are at kind of very early stages of sort of conceptualizing a program of applied research in this space. And admittedly, the deeper we go, the more we appreciate the complexity of this challenge. So I think I'm really curious to hear how others are thinking about this problem in their own contexts, um, whether that's sort of theoretical or applied. But broadly, my intention for today is really just to tell you a bit about who we are, sort of why we've started to focus on mis and disinformation in Canada. And I'm also going to share a little bit about where we're at in developing a program of work um, and some research activities that we have underway. So as uh, Kiara mentioned, I'm the lead of behavioral science in the Privy Council Office in the Government of Canada. And within the Privy Council Office, our behavioral science team is sort of nested within an innovation unit that has a mandate to really support departments in um, testing and implementing more outcomes-based approaches to how we design policies and programs and communications. And so behavioral science falls within that sort of broader innovation umbrella. And as Kiara also mentioned, some important context for folks is that since March, the majority of resources in our unit and my whole team has pivoted entirely to supporting our, our government's COVID response work. So that's the space that we're kind of playing in with the majority of our time right now. And I'll say that COVID really sort of necessitated a shift in how we work as a behavioral science team. So back in March, we had to very quickly stand up a kind of new research architecture to support um, what was very rapid and responsive research and analysis to kind of keep up with demands across the system. So you can see here that we've been collecting data from Canadians sort of since April 2020, really using three main channels. Uh, the first is our sort of COVID-19 snapshot monitoring study called Cosmo Canada. And essentially back in April, we adopted the WHO's behavioral insights tool to the Canadian context in the form of a, a nationwide longitudinal tracking study. And this study has been following the same cohort of about 2000 Canadians over time and is essentially really monitoring their knowledge, their risk perceptions and their self-reported behaviors as the pandemic evolves. And I'd say more generally, we've been using this tool um, to really identify kind of early warning signs or trends that are emerging in Canada that may warrant some further investigation. And I'm giving you this context because I'm going to share a sort of snippet of data from our Cosmo study just to set the scene for why we've begun to kind of focus in on mis and disinformation in Canada. And I'll note really quickly sort of throughout the last year, we've also been taking deeper dives on key public health behaviors like mask wearing and vaccination through online survey experiments and in-field work, um, which you kind of see highlighted in blue here. So I'd say that as we continue to monitor changes in risk perceptions and behaviors over time uh, and try to test interventions that might bolster adherence to public health measures in Canada, this ability to sort of discern the accuracy of misinformation has really continued to parse it out as an important factor in many of the analyses that we're running. And I'm just going to share sort of two quick examples from our, our COVID portfolio of work just to give you a flavor for what we're finding. So through Cosmo, especially in the later waves, we've been presenting respondents with a series of sort of true and false statements related to COVID and prompting them to rate the accuracy of those statements. So for example, you can see on the left here some false statements that are drawn from popular fact-checking websites like the WHO's fact-check page. So things like the COVID-19 death rate has been deliberately and greatly exaggerated or sort of new COVID vaccine technologies alter DNA. And I think we and our colleagues, when we started collecting um, or sort of prompting accuracy responses to these questions, we were really surprised at the proportion of our sample who either classified these statements as 
true or definitely true or probably true or who indicated they were unsure about the accuracy of them. Often between sort of 20 to 30 percent of our sample for a given statement. But moving beyond descriptives, we've been running sort of more advanced models using this large data set we have to really understand kind of what factors of the many that we collect and have seen in the literature are most sort of strongly associated with the outcomes that we're interested in. And graph A on the left here visualizes the findings from one of those models, which really aims to predict Canadians' intentions to vaccinate against COVID-19. And just to kind of orient you really quickly on the y-axis, you'll see a list of sort of cognitive and behavioral factors that we're collecting across waves. And then on the x-axis, you'll see the sort of unique impact that each factor had on intentions to vaccinate in this model. And as you can see, sort of highlighted in that red box, we found in our data set that the ability to discern the accuracy of misinformation statements about COVID is showing to be very strongly and sort of uniquely associated with Canadians' intentions to be vaccinated. So the better someone is at kind of correctly identifying misinformation in our sample, the more likely they are to get vaccinated. And this has consistently been sort of one of the strongest predictors we've collected, uh, particularly in the later waves of the pandemic. And then that graph B on the right just sort of further visualizes this relationship by segments of the population based on their vaccine intention. So you can sort of see here in that left bar of individuals who indicate they'll get a vaccine as soon as it's available to them, 90% of them sort of identified all of these misinformation statements as false. And that percentage sort of significantly gets smaller as you move across the vaccine acceptance spectrum toward individuals who have no intention to get a vaccine at all. So I think it's important to note that this is sort of just an association and we can't kind of speak to directionality or causality, but I think the pattern is really mirroring what we're starting to see in the published literature in this space. So I think, you know, these findings, along with sort of many other signals we've seen through our data and from the international community, have really started to alert us, I think, to the threats that mis and disinformation may be posing in Canada, both sort of within the COVID context, but also beyond. So in response, we've launched a program of research that's really grounded in behavioral science, and it has kind of two main objectives. The first is really, oh, sorry, the first is sort of really to... Um, I guess kind of better understand the COVID-19 mis and disinformation landscape in Canada and to kind of take a look at the factors, both at sort of the individual level, but also the environmental level that might be underlying susceptibility to misinformation and the propensity to share misinformation online. And then our second objective, both in collaboration with others within the Canadian federal government, but also with the OECD, is really to use that knowledge to try to further design and test interventions that might be effective in either sort of reducing or slowing the spread of misinformation online. And I'll say that we're rooting our early work in the COVID-19 vaccine context, but sort of with a view to expand to other domain areas, depending on what we're learning. So in our current state, we're very much in this kind of early scoping phase of the work where we're trying to synthesize the existing research in this area, which, um, as Kiara has said, in some ways is very prolific and in other ways is sort of very nascent. And we're trying to understand what sort of initiatives and approaches have been tested to combat mis and disinformation. And to do that, we're kind of we're carrying out a few research activities, but I'm really going to focus in on sort of two in particular, these two boxes highlighted in, in red. And uh, Kiara thought it might be helpful for me to just share some early insights of what we're gleaning from these activities. So the first is a series of ongoing reviews of the academic and gray literature related to mis and disinformation. And we're taking a pretty sort of multidisciplinary lens here. And then the second is a series of key informant interviews that we're carrying out with academic experts kind of from a diversity of disciplines. So ranging from psychology and cognitive neuroscience to political science and, and public administration. And so some wonderful folks on our team have been sort of sifting through this, this large literature to understand what is the current evidence base around sort of four key questions. So the first is, you know, who is susceptible to information and why? Who shares misinformation and why? 
does exposure to misinformation actually impact beliefs and behaviors? And then what types of interventions might reduce susceptibility to misinformation and reduce sharing behavior? And we sort of tried to whittle these findings down into a simple schematic here. And I realize there's, there's sort of a lot on this page, but I'll just pull out some key pieces. So starting with that box on the left, on this kind of question of susceptibility, we're finding pretty mixed evidence for the role of sort of socio-demographic factors like gender and age, though there's other cognitive and motivational factors that are showing to have sort of stronger associations with susceptibility. So things like the degree to which people trust in public institutions and science, um, their sort of reasoning, reasoning and numeracy skills. And then at the, the more sort of meso level, we're also seeing that the structure of online environments and social network effects can really sort of amplify and exasperate existing cognitive biases. So just by way of an example, um, there's some interesting work about echo chambers in online ecosystems and how they can sort of create this broad illusion of support and then amplify some biases like false consensus effects and confirmation biases. So then kind of moving over to that box in the middle, we're also seeing that factors that are related to susceptibility to mis and disinformation may not be the same as the factors that are associated with the propensity to share misinformation, though there's likely a great deal of overlap there. And we've come across kind of three prominent competing theories in the literature for why people share information. But for the sake of time, I'll just focus in on sort of the last one that's mentioned in that second bullet which is premised on this mechanism of inattention. And this theory really suggests that people share because they are not paying attention to the accuracy of content. So the social media context is really focusing their attention on other factors like the desire to sort of attract and please followers. And there's been some very interesting work sort of recently published in Nature by Penny Cook and Rand which provides some evidence, I guess some early evidence for scalable kind of attention-based interventions that really nudge or prompt users to think about accuracy as they're engaging on social media platforms. So some interesting sort of work, I think, to look forward to. And then at the bottom here, you see some boxes that shows how we've been trying to put a conceptual frame around all of the interventions that have been proposed or tested in the literature to combat misinformation. Um, for the sake of time, I won't dive too deep, but like very happy to pick this up in the discussion. I think our sort of key takeaway, though, is that, you know, more research is needed in this space, particularly using a behavioral and cognitive lens to really understand what strategies are most effective, for whom are they going to work, and then can they sort of be realistically implemented and scaled. And then lastly, I'll close off with just some high level themes from our key informant interviews, which are still very much underway, but we've tried to roll up some sort of clusters of ideas that are emerging. And I think to my mind, the key takeaway that I've been learning is that many of our collective gaps in knowledge about mis and disinformation is really stemming from a lack of research and empirical evidence in the real world context and natural use sort of settings where people are interacting with information every day. So particularly on social media platforms. Um, and there's a really interesting article in the Harvard Kennedy School Misinformation Review that sort of speaks to this issue and highlights the need for misinformation researchers to really have better access to social media platform data to further our knowledge of, I guess, our knowledge base around mis and disinformation. And it's safe to say there's sort of a fair amount of frustration that's bubbling up in the academic community regarding this sort of lack of access to data. Um, and this issue of sort of lack of collaboration between researchers and platforms, I think underpins a lot of the challenges that are identified in the three boxes on this slide. So just taking a look at challenges related to the nature of the problem, I think it's sort of clear that it's it's very difficult at a fundamental level to understand the measure and spread of mis and disinformation. So we're hearing that most research and knowledge on spread and sharing is really coming from Twitter because they have an open API. We know far less about platforms where misinformation may be more rampant like Facebook or TikTok or WhatsApp in the online environment. We're also seeing that it's it's difficult to measure the impact of exposure to misinformation. And what we do know is likely sort of skewed toward the low end of the exposure spectrum. 
So while researchers have access to expression data, like who liked and shared content, they don't currently have access to impression data, like who actually read that content or was exposed to it. And while we can use expression data to sort of map how misinformation spreads, we really can't understand the true impact of misinformation without understanding who was exposed or who, who it impressed upon. And then sort of lastly, I'll just say on a very similar vein, a lot of the challenges related to interventions are also flowing from minimal opportunities from researchers to collaborate with platforms. So we're hearing that interventions to date that have been tested often lack a lot of sort of ecological and external validity because there aren't really great opportunities to test interventions rigorously on social media platforms. It's really hard to know whether these interventions would work in real world contexts what effect sizes they might have and how they might be optimized for different populations. So relatedly, I think the current body of evidence is really sort of relying on self-report data, which in this community, as we know, definitely has its challenges. Um, so I'm cognizant I've shared a ton of information here. I think we're very excited about this space and kind of curious to hear people's reactions, happy to sort of revisit any of these ideas in the discussion. And given that I'm likely kind of quite over my allotted time, I'll just sort of close by saying, in terms of where we are at in our next steps, we are really actively sort of synthesizing all of these findings from our ongoing research activities with the goal of sort of really narrowing the scope of portfolio, the scope of work, I guess, of our portfolio and, and identifying some early opportunities that we might be able to explore for research and testing. And building on what we're learning and in partnership with the OECD, we're planning to sort of turn our attention to a first study or trial where we can try to test some of these ideas in the Canadian context. Um, and don't want to put the cart before the horse, but we're really interested in sort of this propensity to share information. Uh, so I think that might be sort of an early first target. But with that, I will pause. I will pass it back to you, PR, and apologize for perhaps taking too much time. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was a really a great presentation that I think help, helps us really get a sense of the complexity of misinformation as a behavioral problem. I really appreciated that you, you share your, your thoughts on you know, some of the results you had on factors that predict susceptibility to misinformation. So I, for example, I found fascinating that it's not so much socioeconomic factors that you found, at least in this sample, to be predictive of sharing misinformation, but more trust in government and scientists, for example. And even thanks so much for um, reminding us of the work on accuracy and attention um, recently published on Nature. And ultimately, thanks so much for sharing all your results on almost a weekly basis on your website. So these guys in Canada, actually, they're they are publishing the results um, on their website and everything is open source. So I really encourage you to, to have a look. And um, now let's, let's move on because we have another great speaker. So I would like to introduce to our second speaker, Vru um, Jubanian. So Vru joins us from Lebanon, where is the head of experimentation at the UNDP Lebanon Accelerator Lab. And um, Ruri has done extensive work on product, service, system design, and impact measurement tools. So welcome, Ruri. We are very excited to, to have you here. Thank you very much, Kiara. And thank you, Lauren, for that presentation. Um, can you guys hear me well? And can you see my screen? Awesome. That's great. Um, let me just fix my windows here. All right. So again, thank you. And I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. I think, uh, like I was saying earlier, this is one of the very kind of, um, one of the events that got a lot of buzz on, uh, on social media and uh, I've been getting links of it from, from everywhere. So today um, I'll be sharing with you um, the work that UNDP Lebanon and its accelerator lab have been carrying out over the past several months and some of the work that uh, is on the horizon. And I've organized my thoughts and my presentation today around two main kind of ideas. Um, the first one is that behaviorally informed interventions happen not within a vacuum, but rather as part of an ecosystem of different factors and forces. And the second idea is that um, in order to deploy these interventions uh, for missed disinformation, we need to reg regularly go back and understand how behaviors are situated 
uh, in that constantly changing ecosystem. And I'll try to demonstrate these ideas using two projects I've been working on, we've been working on at UNDP Lebanon. The first one is our work on COVID that aim to understand how people access information about COVID-19, what that information landscape looks like, and how it informs uh, people's perceptions and behaviors. The second project is a collaboration with TED's um, Healthy Internet Project. Uh, and this project capitalizes on crowdsourced moderation to make the internet a better place, kind of to make it better. And just a quick disclaimer, um, I might be talking more about what kind of information we need in order to design sound behavioral insight, behaviorally informed interventions, rather than just focusing on the interventions themselves. So in the next 10 minutes or 11 minutes or 12 minutes, I don't know, uh, I'll give a little background information about Lebanon. Uh, I'll reflect on its people's lack of bandwidth and how that relates to misinformation and disinformation. I'll try to explore how we can go beyond the digital and finally uh, reflect on the role or the absence of government. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'll share some uh, information about the developments that have happened in Lebanon over the last couple of years, because this will kind of set up the stage. And I feel like the best expression or the, the kind of the easiest expression for that is that we're in a state of compounded crises, including COVID, obviously. And in the kind of the country uh, has been in, uh, stuck in political deadlock for almost two years now, following an uprising that started on October 8, uh, 17, 2019. Uh, which led to the resignation of the government. And this uprising really coincided with an economic collapse that brought 50% of the population into poverty. Uh, sorry. Uh, it included hyperinflation and an excruciating capital control that has limited people's access to currency, right? And since then, the crisis, the crises have only multiplied. I won't go into each and every one, but this is just so you can get a sense of what has been happening in this kind of uh, network kind of ecosystem. Um, they, they multiplied up until August 4th, uh, when Beirut literally exploded. Um, this was considered the third biggest explosion in history that left Beirut decimated, right? And uh, it's been almost a year now, and the investigation is still ongoing. And I'm saying all of these because, you know, it'll come back. Uh, it's, um, it's building up to a point. Um, and this was kind of a moment when people's faith in the government is declining, right? And their fatigue is rising, and the political and economic anxieties that we had um, are growing with each passing day. And since then, too, things have continued to get worse. And uh, you can see a couple of events here. And although Israel's bombing uh, Gaza is not technically in Lebanon, it's only a few kilometers away, and it directly impacts the climate in the country and the relationship uh, of people with the environment and the government. And also the latest things that we're dealing with right now is this gas crisis and uh, plans to remove subsidies. So this is kind of the shifting matrix of political, economic, social forces in Lebanon. And media, specifically in Lebanon, also reflects this complex landscape, right? It's important to mention that um, the media landscape is muddied with misinformation, misleading information, and the willful lack of information. And in particular, traditional media outlets in Lebanon are largely affiliated with the country's political parties, which, which is a scheme that, that fragments how Lebanese citizens have historically accessed and consumed information. And this, up until this day, has resulted in further distrust in informal media or legacy media platforms. And like elsewhere in the world, social media in Lebanon also contribute to, to an ecosystem of information pollution as misleading information, voice notes, uh, pictures, et cetera, they circulate easily and readily. And while in many countries, COVID has been the headline for 2020 and, tw and 2021, uh, in Lebanon, there were so many other events to contend with. So it wasn't the most famous uh, uh, event. So our research really, we wanted to ask through our research what this information landscape looked like and how it informed people's behaviors. So this is kind of the kind of the setup, the, the entire work here. And with all of this happening, the majority of people in Lebanon, as you can imagine, have little to no bandwidth to verify information they receive or to even critically engage with it. And around the world, we've seen that most common strategies for fighting misinformation are disinformation, uh, misinformation and disinformation are um, media literacy or and or encouraging fact checking. However, in Lebanon, our research showed that people simply they don't have the time, they don't have the energy nor the interest to engage with the information beyond its surface meaning. And instead, they rely either on their uh, common sense or on their self-constructed judgment of a piece of information or a source that's delivering an information. Fact-checking is also not common, and the top reason for not fact-checking is the lack of interest in fact-checking. 
And these kind of um, results were validated further when we launched a chatbot as a source of COVID-19 information back in December. And the aim of this chatbot was to intervene in the information landscape using a digital channel familiar to the communities we work with, in this case, WhatsApp, the, the messaging app. Uh, and uh, we needed to do this, to do it in an interactive way, because also our initial research showed that people want more engaging, more kind of uh, active ways of, uh, uh, of dealing with the news and not just kind of instructive and, 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 and passive. And the assumption here was that if people solicit COVID-19 related information themselves, as in unforced and, and unstruct, uh, uninstructed, then they are more likely to believe it, to consider it or to engage with it. And we were really surprised to discover that a channel that was designed to supply reliable health information ended up becoming an outlet for people to seek information and resources about the other various crises in the country. And I've extracted a couple of things here for you to, to, for you to see, like messages we received were about, I need assistance, cash assistance, or um, where do I apply for, for a job? Do, are you hiring? I need work. Um, I can't afford to stay home. My house has been damaged from the blast. Are you, can you guys help? So, COVID was not a priority in anyone's uh, uh, kind of daily life. Uh, everything else that was happening in the country was more important. And since we understood or we understand people's behavior and the fact that they don't have the bandwidth to engage more with this kind of information, we need to design our interventions accordingly, right? For example, the work we've been doing with, uh, with Ted's uh, Healthy Internet Project uh, encourages lightweight interactions rather than extensive fact-checking. Specifically, the pilot project that we're working with, I mean, we're one of the countries that Ted is working with, we're not the only one, obviously. Um, the pilot project asks Lebanese youth to flag potential misinformation rather than carry the burden of fact-checking themselves. And this kind of shifts the responsibility so that individual people no longer have to be or have to feel responsible for determining the validity of every single piece of information they receive or they encounter, which adds to their bandwidth. Instead, this project or this kind of tool that uh, Ted has developed asks many people to contribute in a tiny way to address the issue of misinformation and disinformation on a structural level, rather than uh, providing people not just with the tools, but also the responsibility to clean up the internet. So what I was saying earlier about crowdsourcing this moderation is exactly here. And although there's been a surge in interest um, in misinformation and disinformation because of the rise of social media, these phenomena as, uh, as you know, have long, uh, kind of, they have long histories and they even continue to exist outside of the digital sphere. And for example, in Lebanon, there's a really long history of disinformation. And I'll give an example here. During the Lebanese civil war from 1975 to 1990, different political parties and militias would start rumors such as, you know, they kidnapped our comrade or they will attack our area and use these broadcasts to block roads or regions or uh, entire areas or even attack opposing groups. And this was a tool that was used to maintain the state of fear in the country, right? So the civil war lasted 15 years. Additionally, even today, social media aren't the only media that people use to gain access to information, specifically in Lebanon, right? And um, two thirds of the country's residents report that their favorite news organization is based in the country, which is really not surprising because of the robust journalism industry here. And in a 2019 survey, 84% uh, of respondents in Lebanon noted that they get their news from TV, which is up from 79% two years prior in 2017. And all of this matters because there's often an assumption that legacy media or traditional media are more credible. Uh, but in Lebanon, these outlets are affiliated with the country's competing political parties. That results, as I said earlier, in further distrust in these platforms. And it's an exciting opportunity for us to think or to start imagining what options exist outside of the digital sphere and how can we really tackle the um, uh, misinformation outside social media and the digital sphere. And at UNDP Lebanon, as part of the uh, peace, build, uh, peace building work or peace building project, we're launching now a new research project to understand the most common misinformation or disinformation topics that people uh, encounter or they deal with and understand how these specific en encounters relate to people's behaviors. And the, res the results of this uh, research will inform a new or our next behaviorally informed campaign that will be both on digital, uh, uh, that will be both digital and, and analog to fight misinformation. And this kind of campaign is set to launch in August. So in our work, by acknowledging the history of this information, as well as the continued, continued significance of legacy media in the country, we are also considering 
generational divides and urban rural specificities. And if there's one thing that our research on the information landscape in Lebanon that was conducted from September all the way to January uh, taught us or showed us is that a one size fits all approach will not work for any sort of intervention. And I think this is important to, to mention for Lebanon because Lebanon is a really tiny, it's a tiny, tiny country. Like it's, it's 10,500 square kilometers. And even in Lebanon between one area to, uh, and another, um, the differences in perception and behaviors are vastly different. So. We kind of, uh, our research showed that uh, to us very clearly. And this brings me to my final point, which is that we need to also be thinking about the context in which we fight misinformation and, and the absence, uh, in the absence of government. And you remember that in the beginning, I said we haven't had a government in almost a year. Uh, and as a result, uh, there's also no trust in this government or lack of the government, right? So how do we account for this, for that in our solutions? And what central institutions can be activated to give credibility to this work? In our COVID work, uh, again, I go back to, this, to, the, to the biggest kind of project so far, we designed Facebook ads to encourage people to participate in our survey because our survey was online and we were kind of disseminating it using Facebook ads. And we used behaviorally informed messaging to push these ads out and each message that we crafted was an insight that was an insight from the previous national survey. So it was either a quote or a specific statistic or a number that made sense or that, that we thought would resonate pe with people. And we studied each one of those um, to see which was the most effective or which ones were the most effective to better understand uh, what catches people's attentions, attention. And to our surprise, one of the most successful messaging uh, messages was, was this. 57% of Lebanese believe COVID-19 is a conspiracy intended to control people. What do you think? Let your opinions be heard. So when I say conspiracy intend intended con to control people is because um, a lot, there was this misconception and this misinformation that the government is putting all of these measures of lockdown, don't go out and don't do this because people were protesting the entire time, kind of the economic situation, the political situation. So it seemed like the government is just doing this so sh they can shut people up. So with this kind of message, people not only clicked on it and they filled out the survey, which ended up getting 19,000 results, by the way, um, they really also commented extensively on the posts on Facebook, uh, on, the, uh, on Facebook. And these are a couple of um, screenshots that I, that I took out where you can see people are even kind of debating with each other uh, this idea of how COVID is a conspiracy or it's not a conspiracy. So this shows how people are more interested in engaging with conspiracies about the government rather than taking the government seriously as a trustworthy institution or a trustworthy source of information, right? And in our, experiment, in our experiments, we've been conscious of this fact and of the use of government logos, right? Which often uh, hurt campaigns more than they help them. And this is specific to Lebanon, not obviously everywhere, but because of the media landscape, because of what's happening, um, putting a government logo, putting the logo of the government might have uh, hurt our campaign rather than help it, as I said. So one strategy we used uh, to work around this was to also include logos of agencies that were believed to be credible by the communities that we work with. And since we were working uh, uh, on COVID, these were uh, WHO who were leading the COVID kind of the, the, the COVID work in Lebanon and UNICEF as well. And all of this is to say that we can't really imagine the government being a main player in fighting misinformation. So approaches that really foreground the idea that, you know, government is here to fact check and to say this is right or this is wrong, will quickly lose traction in the work that we're doing in Lebanon. And I'm going to wrap up by reiterating two important ideas here. The first one is that the architects of this information already have a deep understanding of human behavior, much better than organizations that are trying to combat it. And second, we shouldn't be working off of assumptions or behavioral trends, but rather rigorously research the various factors that shape people's behaviors and uh, people's perceptions and behaviors, similar to, similarly to what Lauren was saying earlier. And this research needs to be grounded in particular contexts. And, and I can't stress this enough, and I'm so happy, Lauren, you guys are doing this already. The results need to be made accessible to other organizations. And also, if not, important, if not more importantly, to the communities we serve and not just you know, keep it among these organizations and the networks that we work with. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And we'll open it up to, well, I'll give it back to you, Kiara. Thanks so much for it. That was super interesting. And I really appreciate it because you, you, you introduced other topics and other important ideas. So you touched on social media and this idea that, you know, ultimately it's a problem. The main problem is that we don't have enough energy and time to do fact checking. And so taking this into account, it's super important. And I loved your final two messages and thanks so much for, for sharing.
Um, so I see there's a lot of activity on our whiteboard with a lot of questions coming through. Uh, please keep keep asking questions and keep voting. If you don't have access to the whiteboard, just post them in the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, I would also like to invite Niam Anafin to comment on the presentations. Um, so Niam, I hope you are with us. Uh, so Niam uh, is, is Senior Advisor on in Information Integrity at the UNDP, and we share her thoughts about some potential for behavioral entry points uh, based on the U new UNDP's framework on misinformation. Um, you can take the floor, Niam, if you're with us. I'm here, thank you so much. Hi there, Chiara, and, and uh, thank you so much to, to Lauren and Varu for these really great presentations. Um, I, I, I just want to make maybe sort of three, uh, react a little bit to, to Lauren's um, presentation and maybe put Varur's presentation into a sort of a wider context in terms of what UNDP is doing. Um, so first of all, congratulations to, to Lauren. I think that the, the process and the work that you're doing is, is really, really important. Um, I, you know, UNDP is, is on a somewhat similar journey. We're also trying to understand um, how to address information pollution effectively. And just a couple of takeaways from our own consultations and our own applied research, which, which correlate a lot to, to what Lauren was saying uh, and what Varir was highlighting as well. So I, I think the first is that, um, is really just to underscore the importance of, of understanding the application of behavioral science in all aspects of a response to information pollution. So, you know, when, when, when we look at um, how we want to effectively respond to this issue, we really are looking at this from the perspective of how to build public trust in and access to public information sources. How do we build public resilience to information pollution? How can we improve media capacity to respond to information pollution? And then how do we support evidence-based and rights-based policy responses to this issue? And, and across all of these areas, we can see that there's a really important role for um, the behavioral insights and behavioral science in all of these. I think the second point that I would highlight is, and it's something that Varir has, has mentioned also, is that uh, on top of all the complexities that Lauren mentioned, as UNDP working across 170 countries, the other complexity is, is that context is key, right? So there is no one size fits all. There is no silver bullet. There is no one response that's going to be apl applicable in different countries. And that's particularly true when we look across the, the, the political and social landscapes in many of the places where we work. We have countries that are in open conflict. We have countries in political crisis. I mean, as Varir just mentioned, we have countries dealing with, with, with multiple layers of crisis. And so there is another aspect of the, the response that we need to consider, which is really how do we understand the context, the specific context and the specific information ecosystem within which we're working in each of these countries and how do we develop responses effectively to that. And then related to that, the final point I would make is simply that um, from our own applied research that we conducted last year across eight different countries um, with UNDP, one of the, the key takeaways that we saw was that while social monitoring, social listening and online research is, is very valuable in terms of the amount of data, the amount of information that it can provide for you, what we saw, and I think Lebanon was actually a really great example of this among others, what we saw was um, when country offices combine that methodology with essentially human perspective. So audience or user uh, research, um, key informant interviews, focus group discussions, etc. What we saw emerging was a much more nuanced um, and localized understanding of the trends and patterns of disinformation and also how people were interacting with disinformation. So um, I would just again to sort of highlight the point that Varir had made. I, I think um, we really need to ensure that we are uh, on an ongoing basis, really understanding how the public is interacting with the information ecosystem and how that's changing over time and how we can adapt our responses to, to respond to that effectively. Thank you. Thanks so much, Niam. It's great to, to know that UNDP has such a you know, high level strategy. So thanks so much for working on these at multiple levels. That's, that's really exciting. 
And now we'd like to, to hear from Benjamin Kant, who is the head of development, um, the development innovation team at the OECD. Um, so Ben, very quickly before we jump into the discussions with the audience, would like to, I would like to ask you to reflect a bit on uh, these last months and what do you think worked well and what worked less well to tackle misinformation from your perspective? Thanks, Tiara. As I only have two minutes, I make it really short and combine my reflections with short comments, one on Lauren's presentation and one on Ruth's. And the first one is what I've learned from different sources is a reaffirmation that myths and conspiracy theories should not be actively debunked in public information campaigns and behavioral interventions. It's fine to debunk them in on-site workshops where a conversation can happen, but ideally myths and conspiracy theories shouldn't be repeated in the online space because they just have a reinforcing effect. So I'm really curious about that one element in your presentation, Lauren, about the debunking strategy and what you've looked at at the evidence and whether other colleagues in the seminar have evidence that speaks for debunking or against it. And Rua really loved your reflection on the larger systemic components and your presentation. What I was thinking about is so good to do segmentation as you kind of hinted at, and as Lauren also of course presented, in your case with rural and urban divides. In a couple of European contexts, we see that one segment that is against vaccination are supporters of conspiracy theories. And for many of them actually, uh, investing time in kind of collecting their own pieces of information and building their own worldview has a similar effect as the endowment effect or the IKEA effect. They're more attached to the different pieces of information that they collected up to a conspiracy um, because they invested time into it than people who, like me, would watch a trusted news source and trust that information. So I think the work that you're doing and looking into different segments and systemic factors is really important and fantastic. And my question related to this uh, sort of endowment effect for supporters of conspiracy theories is to the audience, whether others have found it in their context and how they go about countering this, because that's a huge challenge, of course. How do you counter that effect? And huge thanks again, Chiara, for convening this and to the presenters. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, so it's great to hear that, you know, I think that a lot of your thinking really resonates with what people is, are actually asking on, on the whiteboard. So I suggest we, we jump straight to the questions we had from, from the audience. And the most voted um, questions um, is one on social media. So I put in in the chat, um, but I would love, if possible, for the, for the person who asked that question to ask it aloud. Um, it's about algorithms in social media. Um, if, he, if you are in the meeting, please speak up. If not, I will just read the question. It's about to what extent do the algorithms use in social media? Yeah. There you um, go. Hey, Amin. Uh, Amin from Morocco. I work with the, the UNDP Accelerator Lab in Morocco. and uh, I ask the question and uh, basically as uh, Ruhr said this uh, issue of misinformation is not new it's something that has existed for a while it's just that I believe with uh, the explosion of uh, new technologies and the means of communication it has reached a level that has become really problematic and I think that social media platforms have contributed a lot to that and I think that specifically uh, the algorithms that govern how uh, information is spread and which uh, article is uh, going to be uh, shared more than others and uh, what are the criteria that are taken into consideration uh, for uh, making those decisions uh, are problematic because they tend to have uh, uh, an unintended uh, effect of spreading this information. So that's basically uh, my question. And uh, going from this observation, how realistic is it to fight disinformation and misinformation without fundamentally redesigning uh, how social media platforms uh, promote uh, content and what are the criteria they use uh, in deciding which content is worthy of being promoted and, uh, and disseminated. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, I mean, and um, that's great. I think it's a fundamental question. Do we, we need to change the structure of social media to make things um, change behaviorally. So we'll turn these to our speakers. Lauren, what do you think about this? 
I think it's a incredibly interesting question and something that's coming up a lot for us. I think I spoke to a little bit um, this sort of burdening literature around exactly what you're raising, sort of the role that the structure of the online environment and sort of social network effects can sort of causally and directly have on behavior, which is an interesting space. There's a really great paper in Nature, um, I think published by Loren Spreen and colleagues. Uh, that focuses on sort of how behavioral sciences can promote sort of truth, autonomy, and, and democratic discourse online. And it gets at this and it kind of provides a little bit of a conceptual frame around the question you're asking and really breaks down some of the challenges that exist sort of at the level of the information itself, but what you're speaking to at the level of sort of algorithmic curation and at the level of sort of social media writ large. And I think there's some interesting ideas put forward there. I think broadly, based on what we are seeing um, in the literature and hearing from uh, from academic experts in the space is that we do, in order to sort of influence change, we are going to need to be able to sort of redesign online environments and at a very fundamental level, get access to platforms where people are sort of living and working to understand the nature of the problem, but then also to sort of design and test interventions to overcome that challenge. So. I can't sort of speak more specifically to it other than to say, I think the question you're raising is definitely coming up sort of time and time again in our key informant interviews and the solution is, is incredibly unclear right now. If I just may, uh, sorry, take the, the uh, add just a little uh, uh, remark. I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's rather uh, unfortunate that we have very brilliant minds who have a lot of knowledge and competencies in behavioral insight and behavioral science that use this in order to increase the virality and work for social media platforms. So the kind of work that we are doing in order to promote information and accurate content, the same kind of resources and maybe more resources and more energy is going in order to uh, increase the virality of content. And I am sure that Facebook and other platforms have uh, very qualified teams of behavioral insight scientists that are working but maybe not in the right uh, direction. So just wanted to share this. I don't know if you're aware of uh, what they are doing in terms of behavioral insight in uh, the most advanced social media platforms like uh, YouTube. And uh, because we, all, we also know, for example, that the, the suggestions in YouTube, sometimes you go to watch a video on how to make a, a cheesecake and you end up watching something about uh, Nazi, uh, you know, or uh, conspiracy theories or whatever. So that, that's also a problematic, uh, yeah. Thanks so much. I mean, we definitely, we're definitely planning to invite people from private sector as well, including Facebook, to to take part in the discussion at future events. And Rory, what's what's your thoughts on these? Thank you. Um, so my my thoughts are a bit mixed. So I'm going to try to be as as clear. Uh, I'm going to try to link it as as easily as as, as clearly as possible. I want to start with what Benjamin was saying because I think it really links to what what, what Amin uh, was also asking, like this: how we shouldn't really focus on debunking this misinformation, debunking myths on social media because this is going to just amplify it, and the effort that's being put there is not really worth it. It's better to use that effort into pushing out correct information rather than debunking it. And I think Amin's question is really, really on point and like, very timely with especially what's been happening in the past two or three weeks where you know the whole point of social media and the whole kind of the, the, the advantage of social media is that anyone can create content they can share content which is also kind of a double-edged sword because then we get a lot of misinformation disinformation but when we see that when we put the kind of the onus or we put the, the focus on big tech to say you guys should be able to kind of filter these out or you guys should be able to to monitor these or whatever i think ideally that would be great but when you see big tech really working against that uh, very obviously, then wh who's really, how can we really fight it, right? And I think it goes back to what he was saying, what I mean was saying, like, is it really realistic to fight misinformation anymore? Like when you see pieces of information or content that is shared on social media and then being brought down by big tech because it doesn't fit into a specific political agenda, then what's the point in fighting it, you know? So I think I don't have the answer. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's something that's very timely and it's very critical. And we've been thinking about this for a long time uh, and hopefully we can come up with something together, maybe in this call or some hints. But yeah, I think uh, big tech, they have all these expertise. They have all of these kind of behavioral insights, uh, behavioral scientists, and they have the algorithms, like the mother of algorithms, but still 
they're not always put you put to use in the right direction, or at least that's what we see uh, uh, a lot of times. Thanks. Thanks so much, Flor. Um, unfortunately, we have only four minutes left in this call, which is a little bit of a shame. Um, so we have time for another question. And the most voted one I just put in the chat is linked to what you were saying about the importance of debunking and inoculation or pre-banking. And the question is, do you think inoculation is a good enough long-term solution to dealing with misinformation? Lauren and Rory, um, up to you. Yeah, Rory, I'm curious to hear sort of your thoughts on it. Um, I think broadly, my sort of key takeaway is that, as I think Rory kind of commented at the end of this presentation, this is a complex space. We've got very heterogeneous populations and there's likely many drivers um, that sort of feed into susceptibility to misinformation and propensity to share misinformation. So broadly speaking, I'm not, I don't feel confident that there is one solution that will sort of fit all and it's going to require sort of a range of solutions um, that vary on the spectrum of sort of the level of user engagement. Uh, the, I think our current read on the evidence of um, inoculation type approaches is that they do show promise, but we don't have a lot of evidence to understand how they work over time. So how do those effects actually decay? And I think that's sort of a limitation of the broader literature in this space is we, we don't know how long those effects will last. So I think there's sort of more work to be done there. Um, and then generally just to kind of pick up on the trend around debunking, it, it's an interesting space. I think there, there is a literature that suggests this, this isn't a sort of ideal strategy, might not be the most effective strategy and there could be potential backfire effects, but then we hear from other academics who sort of feel the opposite, that sometimes those backfire effects are overblown and there is a place for sort of debunking in, in certain contexts. So I think all that points to the fact that we need a more sort of complex and varied solution set um, and not any one approach will be able to sort of be a silver bullet in this context. Thanks, Lauren. I agree 100% with what you're saying. And I think, I mean, when we talk about kind of inoculation, there's an assumption that misinformation, disinformation is a, is a kind of very clearly defined, very kind of well-structured one type of phenomenon, right? Which is not, and it keeps evolving. Uh, architects of this information always find different ways of kind of sharing this information. So to say that we're going to, there's a way to kind of inoculation is a good enough uh, uh, kind of methodology, I think maybe for what misinforma misinformation and disinformation is today, yes. But what's going to happen next year? What's going to happen in two months? We don't know. Like these methods and these kind of uh, uh, strategies, they keep evolving just like they've evolved since, since the past uh, century, right? And I agree that it's not, it's not just one solution. It's, it's, it's a family of solutions that are based on different target groups, that are based on different areas, based on different personas, right? So this is why the idea of segmentation and understanding where each intervention is being deployed, uh, the, peop the communities in which each intervention is being deployed, think and perceive and behave so that we can craft it accordingly. So I, I, I mean, I agree 100% with, 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 with what Lauren was saying. It's it's dozens of interventions at the same time to try to tackle what we have now and keep doing that because I mean, keep being on the lookout of what's, what's coming so that we can keep kind of designing new interventions and tackling new forms of, of, uh, of fake news, disinformation, and misinformation. Thanks so much to both. So unfortunately that's um, all what we have got time for today. So I would like to thank our speakers, our co-organizers, and Roxani and Jennifer from UNDP, and to all of you for tuning in and sharing your, your insights. So this is not the last uh, meetup we want to organize on this topic. So for the future, we are really thinking about organizing these almost on a, you know, um, on, on a, like several times. And for this, we, we just created another space on the whiteboard where you can share what kind of topics you would like to cover for the next meetups. So we created a space that you can fill out even after um, the end of this call. And um, so thanks so much for tuning in again. And on behalf of the OECD, I'm really looking forward to seeing you at future events in the behavioral science space. Thank you so much, and I will see you soon.